Looking around the quiet town of Livingston, Montana today, one wouldn't suspect that it was once a booming railroad town, at the time intended to be one of the largest cities in the West. The downtown streets seem to emulate the promise of a larger town, while the surrounding area dissipates into humble residencies, reflecting the simple country life resonating throughout southwestern Montana. It wouldn't be such a far-fetched claim to say that Livingston's boom days were at the turn of the century, from its beginning in 1882 to the 1940s. The North Pacific Railroad brought a plethora of new people and entertainment, from rail yard workers to visitors like President Teddy Roosevelt going to Yellowstone Park. People poured into Livingston and all kinds of new businesses were started after the first winter of 1882 to 1883. The first town in the area was solely devoted to the sale of whiskey to Native Americans and supplies to soldiers passing through. A ferry was built in order to ship merchandise back and forth by river from this early town to others in the areas. The ferry was frequently used by travelers and traders, which created a ripe opportunity for businesses. Soon after the small settlement was established, just miles downriver from where Livingston stands now, Saloons and stores sprung up one after another. In the late 1860s, settlers named this place Benson's Landing, after Amos Benson. Benson's Landing had been described by historians as the headquarters and main resort of frontiersmen of the Upper River, or as a trading establishment, whiskey being the principal commodity and the customers being Crow Indians. When the Northern Pacific Railroad arrived in the mid-1880s, life at Benson's Landing changed. Merchants from Bozeman and other surrounding areas arrived, trying to sell their vegetables or tobacco to people arriving on the railroad. There was no longer need for a ferry to float goods downriver. The railroad could perform that job now. And because of the railroad, more and more people came flooding in. In fact, without two men in particular, Livingston may have never become the place it is today. Joseph J. McBride and George H. Carver set up tents just outside of Benson's Landing, preparing for the oncoming of people. On July 14, 1882, Joseph McBride, representing Bruns and Kruntz contractors, set up a supply store for the Northern Pacific Railroad workers. Then came George Carver two days after, later becoming one of the city's leading businessmen, with 30 freight wagons, 140 oxen, and over 140,000 pounds of merchandise to begin a supply business. People came in large numbers to Benson's Landing, either to set up shop or to settle down in the beautiful landscape, and soon the town became known as Clark City, after Heman Clark, the principal contractor of the Northern Pacific. It is believed that the community of Clark City was located near what is the southeast side of Livingston today, near the riverbank on South H Street. By December 1, 1882, Clark City already had six general stores, two drug stores, two hotels, one hardware store, two restaurants, two watchmakers, three blacksmiths, two wholesale liquor dealers, two meat markets, and over 30 competing saloons. The Northern Pacific Rail Company decided to put up a new town site in the fall of 1883 northeast of Clark City. They called this town Livingston after Johnston Livingston, a railroad director from St. Paul. The towns, at the time, were quite a substantial distance away from each other. However, in today's terms, they were close enough to merge into one town, which is, of course, what happened. By the end of 1883, the town had reached over 5,000 citizens. Livingston's sudden and exponential growth in its first few years was unmatched by any other town along the northern Pacific, and many businessmen saw potential in this growth, and thus began the metropolitan development of Livingston. 
Real estate was booming and a person could buy a residential lot for $25. A house on a lot on B Street was $300 and a first class commercial corner was $1,000. Of the numerous businesses hastily set up in 1883, there are only three which have operated continually since then. The Livingston Enterprise, Saxon Friar, and the First Interstate Bank the name of which has been changed four times since its beginning as the Bank of Livingston. Many other businesses have thrived in the town, but none so persistently as those few true natives. Livingston's rapid progress did not go unnoticed by other towns. After the editor of the Bozeman Chronicle, S.W. Longhorn, visited, he commented on the apparent prosperity of Livingston. By the summer of 1883, Yellowstone Park was drawing in hundreds of tourists, and local hotels were kept busy with the eager visitor passing through to the park. Yellowstone National Park was created even before Livingston was founded, but its success and tourist traffic was nothing before Livingston. People from all over would take the most convenient rail to Livingston and head toward the entrance of the wonderland that was, and still is, Yellowstone National Park. Nearly 2,000 tourists passed through Livingston in the summer of 1883 when there were few more than 1,000 people in the town. The first issue of Livingston's first newspaper, the Livingston Gazette, described the small town with much praise, saying it was the key to the world wonders. Celebrities came to the park, among some of them President Chester A. Arthur, Secretary of War Robert T. Lincoln, Generals Grant and Sheridan, and many other officials. In 1903, President Roosevelt rode the Northern Pacific Rail Line to dedicate the stone arch in Gardner. The rail line operated in a less than formal manner, stopping at random times for various purposes. Some tourists have claimed the train stopped for 10 minutes in one place to leave a box of merchandise in the middle of a field. There were accounts of the engineer stopping the entire train to chase prairie chickens with a pistol, and one time the engine slowed to allow passengers and crew members to drink buttermilk a small girl had brought to the tracks. British author Rudyard Kipling was one of the first tourists to visit the park. He praised Livingston and the incredible scenery, but was unprepared for the people. He described the masses of people in crowded mobs as vulgar, rampant, and ignorant. The Northern Pacific was the official means of transportation to the park. While stagecoaches were the main transport inside the park itself, until automobiles were allowed into the gates in 1915. Soon, Livingston became famous for its fishing and quality permanent residence. The Enterprise wrote, In no town of its size or age in Montana are there so many families of education and culture than in this city. Many wealthy families were drawn by the grand scenery and supposedly healing climate. The Enterprise's story shed a more civilized light on the town, but in reality, not all the residents were as refined as they claimed. At the time, there were complaints of cowboys riding through town shooting off their guns, and in that first year, it was noted that a jail was needed for the drug dealers when a group of white and Chinamen were arrested for smoking opium. By the end of the summer of 1883, funds were more provided by Gallatin County to build a jail. Downtown Livingston's distinctive look, in contrast with its more humble background, is basically the result of two men with the same vision, but for different streets. A.W. Miles and C.S. Hefferlin, two wealthy businessmen, were the men to make Livingston. It used to be said that the Hefferlins owned Main Street, and then Miles owned Second Street. It's not a stretch to say the two men were highly competitive. Both built banks, both built theaters, both were associated with large stores. When Miles found that 2nd Street lacked a bridge over Fleshman's Creek, like the one on Main Street, he did not hesitate to build one which he donated to the city. Thus began the inception of the city of Livingston, 
from the rivalry of two ambitious men whose combat fed the greatest growth Livingston has ever had. One grand allure of downtown Livingston was the red light district on B Street. While most other Midwestern towns had completely outlawed such areas, Livingston boasted a very successful red light district. It was an openly established part of town and was mostly tolerated by the locals for over half a century. Organized prostitution was, as in many other railroad towns, brought by the railroad. The mass of single men needed to work the machinery required equal entertainment. As the crew moved, so did the ladies. The B Street houses served as the town's social hub from the 1890s to the 1920s. In early Livingston, cowboys were not socially accepted and would find acceptance in the brothels and alcohol. Around 1914, the construction of Central School, now Lincoln School, brought about opposition to the red light district as it was less than a block away. Some parents threatened to remove their students from school if the brothels were not closed down. Though many residents were not opposed to having the district, most agreed that children of a young age should be sheltered from such an adult influence. Despite this mindset, the houses still flourished for many years. Lonely cowboys were not the only people to benefit from the prostitution business. The girls brought in significant income for clothing and alike mercantiles. The girls were well-dressed and spent the money they could allot for themselves on fine dresses and perfume. The houses were officially closed October 2, 1948, and prostitution moved outside the city limits. These establishments continued operations until the 1970s, often serving as sites of passage into manhood. Some say that Livingston lost some of its color when the red lights went out. The brothels were not the only rowdy business in town. Livingston has boasted a number of saloons throughout its years, one of which held the namesake Madame B's Bucket of Blood, a sort of chain name for saloons in the West at the time. The Bucket of Blood was situated at the corner of Park and Main Street, now the Murray Hotel. It was owned by Madame Bulldog, named so because of her build and her tendency to be her own bouncer, regularly kicking out frequent customers, such as Calamity Jane, who was known to be the most obnoxious frequenter. At the time, she lived in a cabin on Main Street. Calamity Jane would tell tall tales in exchange for drinks and was known to have been kicked out by Madame Bulldog when she slapped a man in the face and used mule skinner language. The bucket of blood didn't last long after its opening in 1882, and only a short time later in 1885, Madame Bulldog left town and was never heard from again. The entertainment in Livingston didn't end the red light district and old saloons like the bucket of blood. Although the venues changed, Livingston has been notorious for housing amusement-loving people. By 1882, there were already four theaters in Livingston, along with a large skating rink on North Street, where traveling productions would be held. The skating rink burned down in 1888, but productions were picked up immediately and put on at Fowley's Hall. In 1892, a businessman named C. F. Hefferlin finished a $60,000 opera house, which remained the ultimate center of entertainment, until it also burnt down only 13 years later. Hefferlin was quick to build a new opera house, one even more extravagant, as well as the auditorium, which was used for dancing parties. The first motion picture theater came to Livingston in 1912, when it was announced that the opera house would now only play motion pictures. The movies were instantly successful, and soon every theater began playing motion pictures. Oftentimes, the stars would even make personal appearances when their films were playing. In 1930, H.W. Netson built the State Theater, now the Empire. The elaborate Strand Theater was sold to the First National Park Bank in 1965 and torn down for bank expansion. Today, the Empire Theater is the only movie theater left in Livingston. However, the city also boasts a small community theater, the Blue Slipper, which was converted to a theater from the old Park County News Building in 1967. 
For several years, a building south of Livingston was used to host community and school musical productions, and then in 2009, the city granted Crazy Mountain Productions the Old East Side School on Lewis Street, and the construction of the Dulce Theater and the Shane Lilani Center for the Arts began. Now the center hosts a range of events from weddings to Broadway musicals. Day forecast bring black tall rings and hellfire. My hand picked handle is kid gloves till it deals. The hella button not to shake cases are useless. My scotch guard Macintosh shall be carbonized. Now they're offering views of exiting empires Such breathtaking views of Scythian empires Scythian empires Horsemen of the Russian steppes Scythian By 1870, 10% of all Montana was Chinese. However, there was much prejudice against them. People were suspicious and distrustful. The Chinese community worked mainly on railroads, mines, laundries, or kitchens and restaurants, and the population was mostly made up entirely of males. The 1886 Exclusion Act made it illegal for Chinese women to continue immigrating. On the first few blocks of Main Street, several Chinese restaurants were established, Sam's Noodle Parlor being the most popular of them all. Downtown, where Sky Federal Credit Union now stands, the Chinese had crafted a makeshift Chinatown where all food for these restaurants was cooked and then transported by underground tunnels to the restaurants by demand of the rest of the community. The Chinatown was eventually torn down with tons of money found hidden in the walls of their small shotgun houses. Education in Livingston began as early as the town itself. Fanny Allen was the first teacher, and the first school was constructed in 1883 at the present location of Eastside School, and classes began in 1884. The building only lasted 20 years before it was replaced with the building that now stands, today used as the Shane Lalani Center for the Arts. The Westside School was built in 1892 on a lot donated by the railroad. It is the oldest school in Livingston still standing, though the roof was rebuilt after it was destroyed by a fire in 1907. This school later became the home of the Park County Museum. Before a high school was built in Livingston, the attic of the West Side School was used for basketball practice. In 1914, construction began on what is the new Lincoln School building. However, it was open only for a few years before it was converted to an emergency hospital for an epidemic of Spanish influenza in 1918. The greatest contribution to Livingston's boom was the Northern Pacific Railroad. One Northern Pacific land commissioner was quoted as saying, It is the intention to make a big town out of Livingston. It is the intention to build of Livingston the largest shops between Portland and Brainerd. The North Pacific Railroad bought most of the land surrounding the passenger depot and then sold lots for commercial and private use with the requirement that the land be improved with good buildings. The first passenger depot in Livingston was erected in the 1880s on the north side of the tracks. Livingston came to have the greatest railcar shop in the northwest, with a machine shop, an engine house, a boiler house, a blacksmith shop, car shops, a 54-foot turntable, and a 15-stall roundhouse, as well as facilities for coal, oil, water, and timber, and employed over 600 men. About 250 locomotives depended on maintenance from these Livingston shops. The depot which stands today was erected in 1901 and was designed by the same architectural firm which designed New York's Grand Central Station. 
The building was originally built for Butte, but the site for but the site for building in Butte was too expensive. Livingston took the opportunity to donate a site for a new depot, and the building planned for Butte was placed here instead. It was noted by a paper that there is nothing in Livingston's surrounding environment that would suggest building an Italian Renaissance station, so building it was more of a statement to the rest of the country than an action of necessity. The new depot soon became the physical force and historical landmark for the town. It became a symbol of Livingston's bright future. The canals and the bridges, the embankments and cuts, the blasted and dug with their sweat and their guts. They never drank water, but whiskey by pints, and the shanty towns rang with their songs and their fight. Navigator. Navigator, rise up and be strong. The morning is here, and there's work to be done. Take your pick and your shovel, and the ball dynamite, for to shift a few tons of this earthly delight. Is to shift a few tons of this earthly delight. They died in their hundreds, no sign to mark where. Save the brass in the pocket of the entrepreneur. By landslide and rock blast. They got buried so deep that in death, if not life, they'll have peace while they sleep. Navigator, navigator, rise up and be strong. The morning is here. And the Northern Pacific Railroad brought visitors, businessmen, armies, and laborers. It not only created the town of Livingston, it helped the town flourish and find its place as a successful community and center for culture, and a gateway to the great wonderland of Yellowstone National Park.
Yeah.